Today, Don Tree and I are going to preach together. Yes. And um, we have been in, this is our sixth week, I can't believe it, in a little collection of talks. He's preached for the last five weeks. I think they've been some of the best messages. Come on, can we put our hands together? It's been incredible. I, we should, this should have been the merch you line met. right here. We should have put in pink, that. single and secure, right here. <laughs> can't even see. But anyways, um, I wrote a book that we released a few weeks ago. If you haven't got it yet, I think this is a book for really for all people. And um, we've been saying it this way. If you want to, if you want to end, you know, married and happy, you should start single and secure. And so for the last five weeks, we've talked about so many different things. Last week, I preached a message on entitled dehydrated dating, but um, I thought we would bring the collection to an end, talking a little bit about marriage, really all things marriage. And so, uh, don't you, why don't you read our passage today, Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to do our best to uh, preach this thing together. Yes, it says, verse 22, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For this reason, a man will leave his, mo- his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Are you taking notes? Because uh, <laughs> this is a whole lot here. Um, I want to talk today, or we want to talk today from the subject of really, we titled the message a tying the knot, tying yeah. the knot, and talking about having a secure marriage and uh, really been talking to singles throughout this collection. And once again, we're talking to singles still, but also to those that are married in the room. And uh, we want you to walk out of here today encouraged and built up, equipped right. to... Um, to understand why God gave us marriage and the power of it. Yeah, and I think as we talk about tying the knot, I know that there are a lot of different relationship statuses in this room, but um, I believe that God's gonna speak to you today right where you are. I know that for a lot of you in this room, you've been on the journey with us over the years. Um, Maybe you've been with us since we started VU, even before we started VU, But I'm also very aware that there are people watching online today, people in this room that you came for the very first time and you don't know anything about us or this community. And so I wanna share a little bit about our journey. Uh, Rich and I, we met when we were 17 years old and we met in Nashville, Tennessee. I was um, singing there and Rich was visiting his brother who was on the same record label that I was on. And we met briefly uh, one afternoon, actually in church, and I didn't think I'd ever see Rich again, but he got my number and he started calling me. It's what you do. (laughs) And that started a year and a half of a long distance relationship, but then uh, we ended up going to college together in Tennessee. We dated for four and a half years. We got married after four and a half years, and we've been married for 15 years now. And yeah, I'm grateful. Those 15 years have been great. There have been all sorts of seasons that Rich and I have walked through together. One particular one that I'll point out is we walked through eight years of infertility where we got reports from doctors that it was going to be very difficult for us to ever have a child. And, you know, our lives um, parallel to this church and this community being built 
a miracle in motion. And God did a miracle four years ago and gave us our first son, Wyatt. And then we had a wild who's two years old. And eight months ago, we gave birth to our, our little girl, Waylon Wesley Wilkerson. And what I can tell you about our relationship is that we're not the same people that we were when we were 17 years old. We've had to make a lot of space and give a lot of grace to each other to become who God has called us to be. And God is still working on us, and he will be until we breathe our last breath. We are both works in progress. And Rick kind of talked about this full circle moment that we had last month as we celebrated 20 years together. But we had another full circle moment last Sunday, actually, because Rick was preaching uh, his fifth message in this collection, Single and Secure, and it was actually his birthday the next day, on Monday, this past Monday. And so last Sunday, as he finished his last sermon, we decided to go on a date after church, which you need to date your spouse. Can I get an amen? Date your spouse. And we went out to eat in the Grove, which, if you're watching online, it's a neighborhood very close to where our location is here in Miami. And as we sat in the restaurant, we we had some great talks together, went home, went to sleep, and it wasn't until the next morning, talking with our family, that we realized that as we celebrated his 38th birthday, that 20 years ago, right above us, that restaurant we ate at on the second floor directly above us, 20 years before, we had had our first date and celebrated his 18th birthday. (laughs) At the world famous Cheesecake Factory. Hello. You gotta love cheesecake. But it was such a full circle moment for us because... Strawberry lemonade and... Avocado rolls. The orange chicken. Can we go here? No, sorry. Like, start calling off items from the menu. We still love food as much as we did then. But I think that longevity brings you to many full circle moments like that. I think the story of anyone's life when you decide to journey alongside someone for longer than a few years is that God somehow brings you into these surreal moments of reflection and awareness of how he is so invested in every single detail of our life. And today, as we speak about tying the knot, um, I, I know that there are a lot of people in different seasons. And I know that culture would tell us, well, to go the distance, you know, you need to give people freedom. Open relationships gives you the freedom to go the distance or, you know, doing whatever you want or championing each other to, to live a life of no, no strings attached. Just walk together and celebrate and do whatever you feel. But statistics would show you that that approach to relationships actually leads to brokenness not longevity. And today we want to talk about living securely in your marriage. We've spent five weeks talking about being single and secure. And we believe that when it comes to marriage, when you create a secure marriage, you empower each other to one day stand before God. Because we're not going to stand before God together. We're going to stand before God single. And if we walk this thing out together for the glory of God, submitting our lives to one another and to God in every season, then I believe that each of us can stand before God single and secure. And that's really our prayer for you today. Maybe you're at the the starting line in a relationship. Maybe you're beginning something new. I mean, what would you say to the people that are just beginning a relationship. Well, yeah, I think people are always asking us that question, you know, like, how do I know it's the right person? When did you know? And like, yeah. is how, what, what do I do before I get married? There's all sorts of questions that come in. And um, I, I think my, my favorite answer in the world over and over again that I've always said, and this has just been true in my life, is that you don't marry the person you can live with. You marry the person you can't live without. It, it's this person that, you know, when you think about your life, you're like, this is, this is who I want to do this life with. And there's so many little principles and tidbits. Um, I was thinking this week, just like for those of us in the room, because we've been talking to single people and some of you are like, I'm single, really ready to mingle. And um, <laughs> others are like, I'm, I'm taking some time, I get it. But I, I, like just 
a few little things in my mind today that are just like, it's so simple. You're gonna go, I already know that, but like, I just think it's good to like hear it in a, in a corporate setting like this. Like, number one, I would say, you need to get to know the person. Like, of course I should do that. No, I know, but like, I talked about it last week. Yeah. Love makes us crazy. Yeah. And we will like, we will turn a blind eye to all sorts of stuff. Here's a good way to say it. Love is not enough. What? Totally. Like, you need to know who this person is. You need to ask them questions. Yes. Um, dating should be a season of investigation, slight interrogation at times. Um, who, who are you? What, what, what do you believe? Talk to me about your financial situation. Talk to me about past debt. Talk to me uh, about, did, do you have other kids I don't know about? Um, you think I'm kidding? I've, I've heard every story you can imagine. I want to meet your mom. Um, you don't like your mom? Why don't you like your mom? I want to meet her even more now. Um, what do you okay. like when you get angry? Every time I've ever been, we don't ever fight. You just hear, I, the stuff I've heard in marriage, like, you've never had a fight? I don't want to perform this wedding. Um, yeah. Because something tells me this wedding is going to create a fight. Um, like, what are your political views? My goodness gracious. Um, what, what do you believe about the scriptures? What's your, Je- Don and I've used this forever. What is your Jesus story? Yes. It's such a good question to ask somebody. Like, it's not enough that they just come to VU. It's not enough that they went to the I Love My City and served. Like, tell me, like, who is Jesus? Yeah. What does Jesus mean to you? Get to know the person. Love, it's beautiful, but it, it just, it, you're going to need to have some other things that you share. The second thing I would say is take some time. Now, I don't want to give you some, like, arbitrary amount of time, you know, but, like, <clears throat> one week's pretty short. Um, Y'all think I'm kidding. Like, this is the stuff. Like, you don't understand, Rich. It was the best 48 hours ever. Um, you, okay. Um, but time is, is a great qualifier. Time is one of the key ingredients of how you build trust with someone. Yes. How do you build trust? You build trust with this word called the truth and time. And so what you're looking for when you're, before you get married is like, is like do we actually have real trust? Can, can, I, can, I, can I trust you? Have you been truthful with me? And we have some sort of time. And I don't know how much time I should tell you. Um, it doesn't need to be a five-year engagement, hello. Um, but, but there should be some amount of time, I think, that you're, you're, you're getting to know them. And the third thing I would just say is, like, you should seek counsel. It's great. I think it's just very, very unhealthy. Major red flags when you are embarrassed to introduce your special someone to your friends. I understand in a community like VU, I hear all sorts of stories where it's like, yo, I don't want to like create, I don't want everyone to know what's up. I understand that to, at, to some level, but at some point, like, if, does everyone, has, has everyone met this person? H- have, you, have you gotten wise counsel? Have you gone to people that you love and that you trust yeah. and allowed them to speak into the situation? I, I want to know in my life, my, my father is one of my most trusted confidants. Like, of course I want my father's opinion. Like, I, I, I want to know uh, the, my leaders, what they think. I want my, my, my dearest friends, my, my, my brothers, my siblings. What do you, where do you guys stand? They don't have to marry Don Shree, but I, but I certainly want them to tell me what they see or tell me what they, what they sense. I, I, I certainly want their blessing. I, I want to know if they have yeah. some sort of a red flag that I am unaware of. I know this sounds so basic, but once again, when I see people fall in love, people get married and they don't involve anybody else. It's just me and this person and we're gonna face it. What you'll find out about marriage and anyone that's in this room that's married, is my mic bothering everyone? I feel like my mic's bothering these guys in the front row. You wanna just give us handhelds? We can just bring them up. Awesome. And let's get one for Don Cherie too. Let's do this. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Alex. She is uh, married and... uh, totally unavailable. Um, it's like... So, so true. When it comes to marriage is that you, you marry a family. Like, you just... Like, I didn't just... I know this... I did not just marry Don Shree. I married this tribe of people <laughs> called the Durons. And, and she married these wild individuals known as the Wilkersons. 
And so it's, it's not just like just one and one. It, there's something bigger coming together. And you just need to be aware of that. And I, I would just say, you got to get to know someone. You got to give it some time. And you certainly need to get counsel in the situation. I think it's so important. That value of seeking counsel, you carry throughout the rest of your relationship because you can't do it by yourself. And we learn from one another. And the minute that you stop pretending like everything is perfect is the, is the moment that you'll realize that we're all just figuring this thing out as we go. And I know for the people in this room and those watching online today, uh, the last thing that we want for you to do is to look at your spouse today once we get done talking or get in the car with your spouse today and for there to be silence and crickets because you feel so incapable of creating a healthy marriage. We did not come here to beat you up or make you feel like a healthy marriage is unachievable. Today, Rich and I came here to open up God's word and to speak hope and healing and joy and strength over you. And our prayer for you is that this week, as you look across the dinner table at your spouse or as you get back in the car and drive home today, that, that you don't have this perfect picture of what you should be and what you clearly are not. But instead, you would be able to look at that person and say, man, I'm so grateful that you decided to give your one life to me. I'm so grateful that you decided with your one life to walk alongside me. And today we wanna speak strength to that. We believe that, you know, there are three things that all of us need to understand about marriage when we look to the word of God. And the first thing that we must understand is that marriage is bigger than you think. Look at your neighbor and say, marriage is bigger than you think. Write it down in your journal if you're watching online. I grew up taking piano lessons. Did anybody grow up taking piano lessons? You know a thing or two. You can play chopsticks on the piano. Fury Lease. Nice. It's Beethoven, it's not a big deal. Did you take piano lessons? Of course. You gotta bring it back, babe. I know, but I just, it's the rhythm part of it that's always difficult for this me. This is true, especially when we dance as well. But you're my favorite dance partner. That was off script. So we both took piano lessons and the, I'll keep moving. The interesting thing about piano is that you just have a handful of notes, right? There's just a few notes. They repeat themselves as you continue, but there's only a few. But within those few handful of notes, the opportunities are infinite. The melodies you can play, the songs that you can create. For the rest of history, people will still be writing brand new songs with the same notes. And marriage is, it's bigger than you think. You may look at your marriage and think that you see its totality, but when you look at the scripture, that we just read, it says that it's a profound mystery. There's a depth to it, there's a beauty to it, there, is, there are possibilities to it that you could never dream of. And the thing that I love about music is that it can move you, it sets the tone, it changes the atmosphere, it can lift your spirits high or put them so deep down in a pit you can start crying because of a lyric when you woke up with so much joy. And that's what marriage is like. Marriage can affect you and impact you in ways that you never dreamed. And all of us need to awaken to the actual depth that this book is trying to convey to us, that it is a picture, it is a parallel of the very marriage between Christ and the body, that there is a beautiful marriage that begins the word and ends the word of God. It's a big story that God wants to tell through your marriage. Yeah, I, I think what you're saying is so incredible and it's important because um, once again, if you're new here to VU, this, uh, if no one told you, is a Christian church. <laughs> Probably should be noted. And um, I think it's important that we as Christians that we understand that we have a high view of marriage. 
I, I think culture, I, I preached the very first week of this collection called Don't Believe the Lie. And the lie that I think culture would say is that culture would say that you need a person to find security. We know that Jesus brings us our security. But the other lie that culture would say is that marriage is not a big deal. They would just say, yo, like just move in with somebody, just live with them, share your bills. Uh, that's the person you sleep with. That's the person you like. And don't get me wrong, all those things are probably true about marriage, but that is not the totality of what marriage is. Yeah. Marriage is not man's idea. Marriage is God's idea. And I think what I want to do as your pastor, what Don Shrew and I, what we want to make sure that we're doing in our community is that we are teaching you what God's word says about marriage. Because when you start to see God's word and you understand the ramifications and the weight of marriage, well, what happens? You start to get a bigger vision of what it is that you have. This marriage that God gave you, well, this thing is profound, to say the least. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says without a vision, people throw off restraint. I wonder today if there's a whole lot of marriages that are falling apart, if there's a lot of divorce that's taking place simply because people don't have a big enough vision of what God intended for them through marriage. Don Tree just mentioned it, but like, God's word says a lot about it. In fact, how many of y'all know the Bible starts with a marriage and then the Bible ends with a marriage? The Bible starts with the story of Adam and Eve and there, that's the very first marriage we have in the Bible, but then you go all the way to the end of Revelation and what do we see? We see the bride, which is the church, waiting for the groom to come back. It's bookended with, with, with marriage, with, with weddings. Jesus' first miracle, anyone know where it was at? At a, praise God, some people read the Bible here. At a wedding. It's actually a really cool story, especially the, those of you that are new to church because Jesus is just cool. Goes to this wedding, they run out of wine. I know, even Jesus thought that was a problem. And um, <laughs> he takes water and he turns it into wine. His first miracle, his very, very first miracle to announce his ministry truly beginning was at a wedding. Why? Because Jesus was teaching us prophetically that he always saves the best for last. And really, he's gonna end his ministry. He's gonna come back at a wedding that when the church and the groom, when he comes back for his bride, which is you and I, we're gonna see his great miracle once again. Marriage is all throughout the Bible. And for all of us in this room, we need to discover the weight of it. Why did God give us marriage? Of course, we know in Genesis, it's for partnership that Adam needed help, all that men said, amen. Um, like, I need help, yo. And uh, my wife is the greatest gift of my life, and hopefully she can say the same about me. But um, we, we help one another. We're, we're, we're partners together. Marriage is for procreation. That was the very first command, be fruitful and multiply. That, like, it is one of the most profound, beautiful, powerful things that God invites us into the creation process with him. How does that happen? It happens through marriage that we have, when we have sex, we get to act. It's not just this physical thing. It is this spiritual, supernatural thing taking place. But I think maybe the greatest reason why we have marriage, and it's right here in Ephesians chapter five, Paul says, uh, it's a profound mystery. What is this profound mystery? I'm not talking about just a man and a woman falling in love and being married. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Your marriage is to portray the gospel to a lost and dying world. Your marriage is a sermon illustration. Done right, by the way, if it's done right, you know? But even, even a wedding ceremony, like we've all been to a wedding ceremony, and whether you knew it or not, you watch the gospel take place right in front of you. There is the preacher or the priest, and he's at the front, and he represents God who's orchestrating all of it. There at the front, to his left, stands the groom, and he represents Jesus we see in the Bible. And then all of a sudden the doors open up and what happens? Everybody stands up because the bride walks in, usually in a white dress, to represent spotless and, 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 and clean and transparent. And who's next to her? It's usually her father and he represents the Holy Spirit. Why? Because nobody is drawn to Jesus without the help of the Holy Spirit. And there in a wedding ceremony, you are watching the gospel right before your eyes it was always in the heart of God that the way that I would love Don Shrew would be in the same fashion that he loves the church and the way that Don Shrew responds to me would be the same way that the church responds to the groom. And it's beautiful because what does the scripture say right here? We, we read it in Genesis, but then here's Paul. He's quoting it in Ephesians. 
he says that a man should leave his mother and father. And what does he say? He says the two shall become one. He doesn't say that, you know, two halves become whole. No, no, no. Marriage is not completion. Marriage is a new creation. And you, you've got to get this because it is bigger than what society would tell you. It is more profound. It is more powerful. It is more wonderful. It is more beautiful. And if you could keep a big vision of what it is that God is doing through your marriage, that he's actually using you to put you on mission, to give you a purpose, to give you a mandate, that you would have a helper, someone to partner with, someone to multiply, someone to build with, but also someone who can help portray the gospel with you. I believe that when you find yourself in difficult days and hard days and scary days, what you'll find yourself is you'll get a big bigger vision. Understand this thing called marriage. It wasn't my idea. It was God who brought us together. And if God brought us together, let no man separate us. Marriage is is bigger than we think it is. It is. And we don't say it lightly. We really believe that your marriage will send ripple effects throughout history. We believe that. I I know that there are some people watching today that you are a first generation follower of Jesus and that you and your spouse have decided that as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. We're gonna serve God with everything that we've got. We're gonna serve, we're gonna give. We're gonna give of our time and our treasure and our talent. You're sending ripple effects throughout history. Your legacy is changed. Doesn't matter what transpired before. All of a sudden, there is a huge turning point because you have decided to surrender your life to Jesus. And can I just tell you, it's worth the fight. It's worth the effort. It is worth the time that you are investing. You know, I think about my parents. I think about my parents' parents. I think about the four generations before me, that it was four generations before me that somebody decided to surrender their life to Jesus and everything changed. And it's, it's a weight of responsibility on me because just because they decided to do it doesn't mean that it makes me do the same. And that the faith that they carried and passed down to me, that if I get lax and if I get lazy, that my children can miss out on the heritage that has been entrusted to me. And if you're a first generation Christian, can I just tell you that your decisions to fight the good fight of faith, to just surrender the daily to Jesus, you are changing more than you know. And that's why marriage is bigger than you think, but marriage is also smaller than you think. Because it's those daily, undetectable, minute by minute, day by day decisions that you are making in your relationship that are coming together to create the story of your life. Marriage is smaller than you think. Yesterday, Rich and I, we were going to my brother's birthday, and on the way, we stopped and got a coffee because how many of you know parents with young kids, we need coffee? We need it on an IV drip. I ran in to get my coffee, and I was waiting for it, and there was a plant in the window. And Rich was in the car with the kids, all three of them, and I was looking at that plant, and I was looking at it growing, and I remembered something that I'd read that as you talk to plants, they grow. Is that right, Carrie? Carrie loves her plants. It's, it's true. They grow. So as you speak to them, these plants grow. And, and all of a sudden, that thought came up in my heart as I was waiting for my coffee. And I got back in the car, and I gave Rich his coffee. I started to drink mine, and I started with Wyatt. And I said, Wyatt, on this car ride, I want you to know how much you mean to us. I want you to know what a great man you are. You're four years old and you are strong and you're honest and you take care of your brother and you love your sister and you're affectionate to us. And I love the way you love sports and I love the way that you love to go outside and I love the way you look into our eyes, the way you sing with me in the morning. And Wild, let me tell you about you. You're special. Since the moment you were born, there's been something about your spirit that's attractive and beautiful and resilient. And then I went to Waylon. And then Rich, as soon as I got done, started with Wyatt. And he went all the way through all three of our children, right? Because in that moment, as we were driving to the birthday, and it was just a calm, crazy Saturday afternoon, it's the small things that build the big things. 
Are you with me today? Some of us, we're sitting around waiting for our marriage to be perfect. But your, per- your marriage will never be perfect. Instead, you can choose to find the glory in the everyday. You can choose to appreciate the person that you share your meal with, that you go to the little league game with, that you fold laundry with, that you pay the bills with, that you talk through family situations and stresses with. You can dive into the glory of today, and you know what? You can say, it may not be perfect, but it's perfect for us. It's what God intended for us. I think so often we're just waiting until all the pieces come together. Appreciate the peace you've got. Look at the person across the table from you in the eyes and speak honor, speak faith, speak out what you see in them and watch as you create space for them to grow into who God has actually called them to be. You know, when when I think about Rich, I think about friendship. Like, I have three really close friends in my life. And when I think about those three friendships, I don't approach any one of those relationships the same. Every single one of them I approach differently. Why? Because they're different. And the way that we interact, it's really different. And, And I think when it comes to our relationship, there are a lot of differences that Rich and I have, a lot. And instead of focusing on the fact that, man, after 20 years, we still cannot agree on a movie, on a Friday night. We still sit on the couch and we look through every single preview and the ones that he wants to watch, I'm not gonna watch. And the ones that I wanna watch, there's no way he's gonna watch. And usually by the time we get done looking at previews, I say, you know what, I'm good, babe. I'm tired anyways, let's just go to sleep. 20 years of trying to get on the same page in something that small. But you know what? That's not where my focus is because that's not the point of our marriage, that we agree on a movie. I love how different he is than me. I love that when I have an opinion, he completely disagrees and lets me know how he feels. (laughs) Because you know what? After 20 years, he and I, we've learned to make the disagreement right here and still be able to look at each other and go, I am crazy about you. I love who you are. And life would be so boring if all we did was agree with each other. It would be so boring if we only thought the same. I need somebody who challenges me. I need somebody who rubs off the rough areas of my life. As iron sharpens iron, we sharpen each other and it often comes through conflict. Embrace the differences. Love the things that are different about your spouse. You know what we agree on? That our heart fills up with love when we start to talk about our children. That we've given our lives away and want to for the rest of our life for the one thing that we think is worth living for. And that's to lift up the name of Jesus. That we're not deliberating, talking about whether we should be a part of community, wondering if we know what we're called to do. No, we've settled it. I'm just telling you right now, um, you're gonna find a lot of joy and a lot of strength if you can understand that marriage is smaller than you think that it's those day-to-day decisions that actually build your relationship. And some of you are going, well, how do I do that? Use the words that God has given you. You can choose to condescend or you can choose to build. You can choose to believe the best or you can choose to investigate and believe the worst in your spouse. And I, I, I had a revelation in my life when I realized that my husband's ego and my husband's courage, and my husband's confidence, it's in the palm of my hand. That I have the keys to his heart. That he has allowed me to be the closest to him. And that intimate space that I inhabit in his life, it's a precious space. And that instead of tearing him down, I can build 
him up. And by telling him how amazing he is, I'm not making his head big. I'm building faith inside of his heart to fight the battles that are waged in his life, that the enemy would try to take him down, but I can make him stronger by telling him that he's not alone. Is anybody with me today? Come on, let's put our hands together. Marriage is smaller than you think. This is how she preaches to me at home. <laughs> Just builds my faith. You know, one of the things that I, I, we've taught before, and I think it's important, something to write down, is rather than focusing on thinking alike, focus on thinking together. It's really important because ultimately, like, this whole collection, hopefully you've learned this, like, you can't change the other person. I'm, I'm having a hard time changing me, you know what I mean? Without the power of God in my life, I need, I need that's why we come, that's why we gather, because we need the spirit of God to do the changing. I'm a, I'm a handful for myself. I, I, don't, I can't take on her as well. I need to build her, I need to love on her and, and encourage her. And you know, the Apostle Paul, I, just, I love God's word because I think it's just so thorough. And he's writing to a young church, much like us. He's writing from prison, if you can believe it, to this church in Ephesus. And he's talking all about their, their local church and he's trying to teach them how to do this thing called relationships. And so just like you starting a business, you would have roles and you would have structure and you'd have systems. He's trying to do the same thing to the best of his ability about teaching roles for uh, a godly marriage and a household. And he says these two commands. He gives a command to wives. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. And as you read Ephesians 5, what you'll see is you'll see that word submit shows up a whole lot. It's not just for wives to submit. It's that word to submit to each other, all of us. But then he says, husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church. And um, rather than me speak to women, I always just, it's easier for me to speak to men. I, I meet a lot of men that have you know, a hard time going, man, I wish my wife would respect me more. What I have learned is that many times, um, your wife might not respect you because maybe you've never bled for her yet. <laughs> because this idea of me dying for Don Sheree means there's a sacrifice involved. Yeah. Yeah. Marriage is about sacrifice. Like this is not just some hookup relationship. This is not about what I can get for, from Don Sheree. That is not at all what a godly marriage is about. A godly marriage, especially for us men, is about laying our lives down for our bride. That's what Jesus did for us, right? He laid his life down. What I've learned is you, you start bleeding, fellas, you'll find a wife who, who doesn't have a hard time respecting you. I, I wanna be a man who, who, who loves and leads in that way. And how do I do that? Well, I have to die daily. That's why Jesus said, carry your cross daily. As husbands, we have to love our brides daily. It's the small daily decision. What many of us, what happens to us, many of us, we get focused on what we don't have rather than what we do have. My grandfather, one of the best, he just had all sorts of little wisdom lines. My, one of my favorite wisdom lines from Fulton Buntain, he's with Jesus now. He used to say, nobody gets the whole loaf, so enjoy the slice you get. And that'll preach, bro, because I don't care what marriage, Don, you and I, we don't have, we don't have the ideal marriage. Whatever you believe about us, they got a per we don't have a perfect marriage. It's perfect for us. We think it's a great marriage for us. We're doing our best to love one another, but both of us are missing things. Neither one of us are, 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 have been perfected yet. And what happens so often in a marriage is Don Shree has 80% of what I'm looking for in a, in a spouse. She's doing 80% great job, but I start focusing on the 20% that's missing. Let me tell you, so many divorces happen because they go, you know what? They go looking for that 20%. Then they get the 20% only to realize, yo, I'm missing 80%. Enjoy the slice that you get. Don't, don't criticize, celebrate. Some of you ladies out there, now I am gonna kind of charge you a little bit here. Like, like, I'm telling you, what criticism rarely ever changes anything. But what you celebrate gets repeated. That, that, that's worth the entire collection right there because I just gave you the secret to changing that dude somehow. It's not gonna come from criticizing him. It's gonna come from celebrating the behavior that you do enjoy, that you do appreciate. Oh my goodness, look at you. You got out of bed today. Amen, let's go. I know some dudes who don't ever get out of bed, but you, you're my man. Look at you, you woke up before 9 a.m. I gotta say, thank you, Jesus. I got me a good, find something. 
You think I'm, but you start there because what you celebrate will be repeated. It will be repeated. It, marriage is smaller than you think it is. Mar- marriage is bigger than we think. It's God's plan. Marriage is smaller than we think. But lastly, marriage is deeper than you think. It's deeper than you think. You know, how do you go deep? You have to dig. What happens when you dig, friends? You get tired and things get messy. And that's what happens a lot of times like in, in marriage is that like, it's, it's, it's so much deeper than we could ever imagine. It can get, it can get weary. It can, it can get, it can be tiring. And at times it can get messy. Like Don Shree, like she's gonna get all of me. And not all of me is the guy on the platform. There's, there's parts of me that, that there's insecure. There's, there's weak areas. There's things I'm not good at. So we get the totality of a person in, in, in marriage. You get the real person at some point. And you have to decide in those moments how, how you're going to handle that. I, I love, once again, God's word is what helps me. Like, if I didn't have God's word, I don't think I would. It's funny how we can just judge the world, but the world's going to be the world. The world's lost. And so it's God's word that guides us. It's God's word that brings truth and illuminates and heals you and I. And so we have to keep coming back to it. And so when I study God's word, it's just profound that the two shall become one. You know what I've learned about Don Shuri? Don Shuri is me, talking to me, outside of me, reminding me. It's like, <laughs> that's why some of y'all like in marriage, it's like, yo, this person's got a mirror, yo. <laughs> like, when you're single, how many y'all know when you're, when you're by yourself, you can like just... You could know something about yourself, but you can just kind of just like brush past it, kind of hide it. I'm like, oh, let me just go on to the next thing. But when you're married, you're not patient. I'm not, you know, like it's gonna confront you. It's you confronting you. This is what's so beautiful about having this partner is that it's making you better. When you were by yourself, man, you could, you could not confront that. You could avoid that, but now you got you living with you. And before you know it, it, it starts to change you. And all, all I would say to that is that when I get that profound mystery and I start to realize, wow, Don Cherie is me, how silly it is, is it for me to criticize Don Cherie? When I'm criticizing Don Cherie, I'm criticizing me. When I'm putting Don Cherie down, I'm putting me down. When I'm telling her everything that she's not, that's, that's who I am. So I've got I've to go deeper with that. I've got to realize that this is... This is a part of me. And of course, as we go deeper, the only way that we're gonna, we're gonna solve and the only way that we're gonna move forward is through patience and forgiveness. Patience and forgiveness. I've gotta let go. I've gotta let go. We took our kids uh, last week to Orlando. Don't recommend that for four-year-olds, but <clears throat> you do you. And um, people in South Florida, it's like, he's one and a half. He's gonna see Mickey. I'm like, you're done. You're done. That's the next 20 years of your life. So get ready. But... But we, we waited till four and, it, and it, he broke us. And um, it, was, it was actually, we had so many fun little memories. And one of the things is that uh, we went with a bunch of our family members and uh, someone gave Wyatt cotton candy. I didn't, I didn't approve it, but they gave him cotton candy for the first time. I look over and his kid's got a huge, he's like, he's already down like 80% of this whole thing of cotton candy. I'm like, bro, whoa, slow down on the sugar. He's like, dad, I love it. You know, I'm like, <laughs> but yeah, I get it. He's like, oh, I love it. <laughs> I'm like, that's a demon. And um, I go, okay, I go, this is so funny. I go, that's enough cotton candy, bro, enough. I go, give it to me. He goes, okay, I won't eat anymore. I go, I go, no, I go, give it to me. He goes, dad, I won't eat anymore. But can I just hold it? I was like, no, because if you hold it, you will eat it again. And how many of y'all know this is, this is what real forgiveness looks like? Is that some of us, we want to hold on to the past. We want to hold on to the mistake. No, no, I let it go. You didn't let it go. You, you said you forgave, but you're still holding it. And the more you hold it, when push comes to shove, when you get tired, when you get weary, when it gets dirty again, you're going to want to eat from that again. I'm telling you, that's not forgiveness. That, that's going to ruin you. That's, that's going to hurt you. Marriage is going to take you deep. We shouldn't be afraid of the depths. We should embrace it because I'm looking at me. She's helping me get better. I'm, I'm becoming who God called me to become. There's a depth of decisions that we both made 
before we ever met that we brought to our marriage. And when it comes to your own personal depth, the conversations of your soul, you know, single life is a value-based life. And if you're wondering what your marriage is made up of, it's made up of two people's values. And I think it's one of the most important questions that you can ask if you're single or if you're married, what are my values? Because when you're single, it's super easy to cover up what you value. If you're, if you're dealing with jealousy, like you can be jealous on the inside and nobody knows. You can put the dress on, you can have a smile on your face, but um, you're coveting what that person has or you're angry at that other person and nobody would ever know. But when you're married, your values are exposed. They can't be hidden. They come to the surface. And you know, a lot of people spend their time looking for the perfect person to spend their life with. And so much of their measuring stick is based on the outside, what they look like, if they're funny, if they're fun. But values is where it's at. Values is where the rubber meets the road. Values is what allows you to have longevity in your relationship. What, what does that person actually value? Do, do they believe in forgiveness? How do they reconcile when the, there is a break in a relationship? How do they honor and respect? You know, they may treat you like you created the heaven and the earth, but do they treat other people with respect? Because the butterflies are gonna fade and they're gonna treat you according to their values. If you value others, then you treat them that way. And a marriage is made up of values. And I think when it comes to our relationship, you know, our values, it's not just values, he's a man. His name is Jesus. He is our value. That's why I don't have to deliberate with Rich what we're gonna sacrifice for in our life because it's our value. It's not a job title, it's not a ladder, it's not a season. Our value is that we were put on this earth to lift up the name of Jesus. It's a personal conviction. I don't need him to talk me into it every week. I don't need him to remind me. He can remind me that it's all about Jesus, but it's my own personal value. Choose someone based off of values. You can have all the differences in the world. Rich is a night owl. I like to go to sleep early. We could name all the differences, but our values, they matter. And what we've realized about our relationship with Jesus is that we can sit across from each other at a table and you may have the belief that anybody can work it out. If two people sit across from each other, they can work anything out if they just talk. But here's the deal. Could it be deeper than that? Because I do believe that Rich and I can work anything out. But you know why I believe it? Because it's the Holy Spirit who changes us. Because Rich can look at me and say, Don Shree, you are jealous. You're jealous. And I can go, oh, you know what? You're right, I am. But what can I do? Do I just push a button? Okay, I'm not jealous anymore. It's not that easy, is it? He can't change me and I can't change myself. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And so it is a soul surrender and it is a work of the Holy Spirit within us that actually brings the change between us. It's not just two people sitting across a table. It's the work of God in our lives that actually gradually shapes us and shifts us and recalibrates us to stay on the road that God has created for us. It's not just two people. There's somebody else in the mix that makes all the difference. And it reminds me, uh, it reminds me of Ecclesiastes chapter four that talks about a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And the other day, Rich and I were at the house and we were talking about our neighbor. God has given us wonderful neighbors and we're so grateful for them. They're one of the greatest blessings of the last year in our life. And Rich will often say when, our, when we're in our house, he'll say, Scott's a good man, Scott's our neighbor. Rich will talk about him behind his back and say, Scott's a good man. 
The other day after school, uh, Wyatt's teacher told me that in the middle of class, Wyatt said, looked at her and said, Scott's a good man. (laughs) But Scott has these swings in his backyard and he put them up for our kids. And he, his wife calls him MacGyver because he can just kind of do anything. Like he's always outside. He's always on a new project. He's always in his yard building and making something better. So he hung this swing for our kids and he hung it so high in the tree. And he put this massive bolt in the middle of the tree and he has this rope coming down. And at the top is this really tight knot because Scott knows how to tie the right knot. And my kids get on this swing and they go so so far out and they go so high that I feel so safe and secure because I know that that knot is tied properly. And I think that so often in marriages, we're focused on how high we can get and how far we can move ahead. But more than how far you go ahead or how high you soar, it's what you are attached to. It's that knot, it's that security, it's that foundation of your marriage that is found in Jesus. He's the only one who can provide longevity and strength to our relationship and to yours. And I wanna read you Ecclesiastes chapter four. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And I wanna speak to every single person who has surrendered their life to Jesus in this room. Your marriage, it's bigger than you think. It's smaller than you think. It's deeper than you think. But I wanna remind you, because of the foundation of Jesus, your marriage is stronger than you think. Your marriage is gonna be able to withstand the storms of life. Your marriage is gonna be able to make it through the valleys and the dark nights, through the grief, through the loss. On the mountaintops of celebration, you'll be able to keep your focus on the one true thing. Because if Jesus is a center, you now have a cord of three strands. And a cord of three strands is not easily broken. If you decide, I'm tying the knot. Come on, can we put our hands together for God? Hey, this is Rich and Don Sheree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we wanna walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor, if it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to to come. come.